Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Watch and Listen podcast. This is a podcast about watches, hosted by me, Matt Farah, and my friend Cameron Weiss, the master watchmaker and CEO of the Weiss Watch Company, making watches from scratch, including the movements, here in Los Angeles. Uh, Before we get into this podcast, uh, let me say real quick that this episode of Watch and Listen is sponsored by Crown & Caliber. Uh, Crown & Caliber has a uh, a contest running right now. uh, in, co- in cooperation with uh, Matt Hranick and his book, A Man and His Watch. And uh, they do this thing at Crown & Caliber called Watch Stories because, you know, watches like vintage cars um, have stories. So if you go to crownandcaliber.com right now and submit your watch story, you could win one of two Omega Speedmasters that they are giving away to uh, the best entry. So go to crownandcaliber.com right now, submit your story, and uh, win yourself one of two Omega Speedmaster watches. Watches. While you're over there, if you want to buy a watch, code CAM150, C-A-M-150, will get you $150 off your first watch purchase at crownandcaliber.com. That is our treat, friends. Uh, we're also sponsored by the Beeline Coffee Company. Beeline is a delicious roast. It is the t- upper, upper echelon of coffee roasts. Uh, the, the, the beans come from the best coffee-producing regions. They are expertly roasted. And if you want some, BeelineCoffee.com, code CHRONO, C-H-R-O-N-O, will get you 15% out off anything on their store. It's really Really good stuff. Uh, On this episode of the Watch and Listen podcast, we are doing our first ever single brand deep dive. I've been putting this off for a minute, but uh, once we've circled the drain enough, it's time to study the histories and the models and the offerings of an individual brand. So uh, welcome, my friends, to about an hour and 20 minutes on the International Watch Company, better known as IWC. Sit down and buckle up. It's the Watch and Listen podcast. Hello, folks. It's the Watch and Listen podcast. Welcome to the show. Cameron and I are going to spend the first three minutes of this show being really flustered because we had our first technical glitch of the series and my computer ate 15 great minutes of radio. I apologize. So we're going to we're going to back it up. Where did we start before Cameron Weiss? I don't know. We got to keep the enthusiasm. <laughs> keep <though>. the enthusiasm. <laughs> OK, the first thing I'm enthusiastic about is your wife, Whitney, gave me a call and said that after our straps episode, a lot of people went to your website, uh, weisswatchcompany.com and bought strap tools. Uh, I guess uh, you guys, you make your own tools. We discussed that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you can buy them from Weiss. And I guess a lot of people were about the uh, the straps and the tools from your website uh, and went and bought them. So thank you to all of you who have done that. And since we bring up your straps, they fit other watches, not just your watches, right? That's right. 20 millimeter uh, at the lugs. So they fit a lot of the, the sport Rolex watches, Omegas, um, tons of tons of watches. Tons some of, of these IWCs. Yeah, a bunch. Yeah. And so, uh, so thank you to all of you guys who are supporting the show. Also, thank you to those of you who are going to Crown & Caliber and buying watches from them. Um, a bunch of you have. A lot of you guys, if you went out and bought a watch from Crown & Caliber... Um, and you haven't told us about it, by all means, send it over. Show it off. I want to see it. Uh, code CAM150 uh, is good for the next, I don't know, six weeks or so from the release date of this video. we got to keep rotating the promo codes. That way, like the scammers don't just steal the codes and start, start yeah. taking advantage of them. It's for the audience, for the fans. It's not for the scammers. Anyway, today's program as we started on before my computer ate our fucking podcast. Um, Back it back up. Today, not today, this year, 2018, is the 150th 50th anniversary <laughs> of the International Watch Company, better known as IWC. Um, Cameron and I decided, Cameron actually suggested, that we do individual brand deep dives. And so uh, I said, great, you pick the first one and I will do homework. Why did you pick IWC? What was what made that this worth this brand worthy of 
the first ever individual show brand deep dive for the show. I think it has some weird twists in the history, and it's just an interesting brand, uh, the way it was created, and just the the watches overall are are relevant today. And uh, I I had no idea that it was the 150th anniversary. Yeah, that um, is just <laughs> I learned that. I went to go study I went to yeah. go uh to study it and I was like, "Oh, how about that? That's just, this is a great, you know, great uh we could say this is why we did this topic." Yeah. And then I can completely blow myself up on the show. <laughs> um yeah, so this is 150 years for IWC. What how 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 old is like the big 3? How far much further back are we talking there? Uh well, a big thing in watches, have continuous. they always been operating continuous operation? IWC has it. Um, Vacheron has it. Uh, Vacheron also very old. Yes, uh, they're the oldest uh, Swiss watchmaker that is still in operation today. Uh, they're seventeen hundreds. Okay, so they they had IWC by like seventy years minimum. Yeah. Okay. Um, IWC is to me a really cool brand because I think they really exemplify um, the understated, very well made but not flashy luxury tool watch. Eh? Definitely. Is that a, is that accurate? Yeah. I don't I don't think um IWCs are 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 showy watches for the most part. Um my IWC personally is the most expensive watch I own and yet it is probably not the most understated, but one of the most understated watches for sure. Like Cranio said on that show back, you could you could wear one drunk on the subway at 4 a.m. and the guy next to you with the Submariner is going to get jacked, not you. <laughs> Um, but up until recently, I was never really drawn into the brand. I was just like, oh, those are nice. But that was kind of where it stopped. Um, but now after doing the homework for this episode, I'm like much more interested in the brand. So let's start it. Crown and Caliber sent us a bunch of watches. Uh, we're going to do it, uh, the, the, actually the most straightforward way, which is that IWC's website has their entire history published on it. So I'm going to give you a history lesson, um, which I have studied. Cameron will give you a technical lesson. Uh, and as we begin uh, with the history of IWC until now. So, like the dollop would do, 1868, Florentine Ariosto Jones which is uh, who is an American, believe it or not, moves from Boston, Massachusetts to Schaffhausen to found the International Watch Company. And the point of that company was actually to sell watches back to America. But he didn't do this cold, did he, Cameron? No, he worked... Uh, so he, I think he was born in New York, moved to Boston, and he ended up working at the E. Howard... Uh, watch company. Is that one of those like watches. just old OG American kind of companies? Very OG. Back back from the days of Elgin and Waltham and yeah. Illinois Watch Company and, and all of those that, that were making massive amounts of pocket watches in assembly line style with all the latest technology of um, milling machines. and Reproduction. Yeah. Right? Major Make, repeatability so yeah. that all the parts from one watch to the next are identical no matter whether it was produced this day or the next day or by this person on one line or the next person on the, a different line, everything needs to be interchangeable so that you can have service, uh, repeatability, reliability. Uh, it's what kept the uh, the railways safe. <laughs> and uh, so he goes over to Switzerland in 68, sets up shop, and by 75, he's got a pretty big factory um, on the Rhine River with uh, almost 200 employees doing you know assembly line style uh, pocket watch manufacturing, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, and that was very new for Switzerland. Prior to that, it the, was... The factory system yeah, was. Yeah, the, the whole uh, massive factories like that with all this new technology. Uh, the way he set it up was kind of revolutionary for Switzerland. Yeah. So uh, five years later, 1880, um, Florentine sells out and sells to uh, this guy, Johannes Rau Rauschenbach Vogel. Rau Rauschenbach Vogel. Uh, who is like a like an engine manufacturer of some kind? I'm not sure what type of engines they didn't specify. Do you know? Yeah, I, I don't know. I would imagine based on the location, maybe they were making uh, like big diesels or big big engines trains? for ships and stuff like that. Maybe yeah. I don't know, or it could have been trains. Oh, on the on the river, right? right? Yeah, I don't okay, know. could be. Yeah, maybe. at this point, it was right all probably old. Yeah, it was everything big, right? Yeah. And then so he buys the company and dies one year later. His son. Uh, who was just a strapping young chap with a looks like Eddie Izzard <laughs> with a handlebar <laughs> mustache? Uh, Johannes Rauschenbach Schenk, 
I'm not sure how their naming system worked back then. He looks like he hyphenated his last name. He takes over uh, at IWC, and a few years later, we see uh, what we know now as the Paul Weber uh, pocket watch systems, which is... Uh, how do you want to describe the the Paul Weber system, which we learned in our last, the original yeah. attempt of the show, is named after their inventor? Yeah, what was it? Uh, it is... Joseph Paul Joseph Weber. Joseph Paul Weber, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's a digital display, and for those of you not watching the video along with us right now and thinking of audio, you're probably like me, you think of digital as, you know, like a G-Shock or like, a, like an actual electronic digital. Um, but this... Think of the word more literally. Digit. You're looking at the digits. Yeah, and it's like uh, like the date wheel. Right. The date display on a watch is going to be digital. You're going to yes. have a, the digit one for the first day of the month, and it's on a wheel, and it jumps around, and there's just one little square opening that frames that It's date. so weird, yeah. Also think bathroom scale. Yeah, you know? bathroom uh, scale. Uh, and it, you know, it's just, it's a flat face watch that just, the, the numbers move in their little holes, and you don't see you know, big hands moving around or anything. It's actually, it was probably, I mean, imagine back in 85, in 1885, yeah. it was probably like, oh my God, the public's like not ready for this. Yeah. You know what I how mean? Do we, uh, how do we read this? Yeah. And then, uh, and then, you know, if you'd like to see the modern interpretation of that, John Ward was on our podcast and he came out with, he made a watch. It's called the doozy and it looks like this system. And as we will get to the current, there's a reissue now for the 150th anniversary of this. Paul Weber system. Uh, so designed after Joseph Paul Weber. Uh, then you jump forward to 1899. And in 1899, IWC puts a ladies' watch on a on a strap and it makes a wristwatch for the first time. When who else was making wristwatches and when? Um About I mean, then? the the first actual wristwatch that wasn't a modified uh uh, pocket watch would have been the the Cartier Santos, right? Yeah, and that was what twenty years after this. Yeah, so this was actually at the time probably fairly revolutionary as well, right? It was very revolutionary because um, they weren't the first. This wasn't the first wristwatch ever. No, no, no. Okay. and a lot of people had pocket watches and they would take them to a jeweler and have They'd them turned stick into stick lugs on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah all the wire lugs. And that look is actually coming back now. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the guys like Vortic and the other people who uh, take, yeah, uh, pocket watches take and, pocket watches, turn them yeah. into wristwatches. That's like a thing now. Uh, and in 1903, uh, the daughter of uh, Johannes Rauschenbach marries uh, Ernst Jacob Humberger, uh, who ends up taking over the company. Right. Jacob Hum, they just, just great names. I think, uh, so he actually had two daughters. He did, yes. Right? They mentioned this. The other, and then the both husbands went into business together for a while. One was very interested. Yes. The other one not so interested, and he got bought out eventually. Right. So do you know who the other daughter married? Um, I do not. Psych noted but, psychologist Dr. Carl Jung. Yeah, and so, he was he was very into it um, and did a lot for the the company. Whereas Carl the other Jung guy, did. Yeah, the other huh. guy was kind of just. There, hanging out, not not really creating much or or running too much of the business, so that's why he left after a little bit. Carl Young, money did. And, wait, uh, you mean no, no, the other, the other daughter's husband. Oh, the yeah, that's yeah. what she says. Look, Emma Marie Rauschenbach, the daughter, marries psychologist Dr. Carl Young. The younger sister Bertha oh, there we marries go. Homburger. Yes, okay. yeah, the older daughter <laughs> daughter married the uh, the the good doctor. Yes, um, so Homburger takes over. Homburger honestly looks like, goddamn, he looks like he is gonna like run over poor people in his Rolls Royce on the way to his gold lined toilet, you know, and then have servants wash his balls. <laughs> Does it right? He looks like he. I mean, I'm not trying to insult the man, but I think he's dead. But damn, he is yeah. like a a titan of industry, evil looking. He does look quite intense. He does. Yeah, yeah. I don't, don't want to sit down at the opposite side of one of those oversized desks with this guy <laughs> where he's like, listen to me, you know? Uh, anyway, he brings uh, a new era in the company. It takes 10 years from when he shows up, but uh, IWC comes out with the 75 and 76 caliber, uh, which are the first ever movements designed uh, for IWC for wristwatches. So the right size. What else would they change besides size? You'd have uh, the right size for actually going on the wrist, and then you'd also have a stem that is used for winding and setting instead of having a button, a lever set. 
where you press a button and then turn the crown to uh-huh. set the time. This one is like a normal watch today. Like it is you now. Pull the stem out, set the time. Uh, and then also having the stem at 3 o'clock instead of 12. Got it, got it, so got it. So minor kind of setting things. But, but a, a, a noted difference. Oh, yeah. A noted accomplishment. Uh, in 1931, uh, IWC creates a rectangular watch with a rectangular movement. And I'm I'm actually wearing, if we'll, we'll cut back to this right now, I'm wearing right now a Frank Mueller which is on loan from Crown and Caliber, but it's a rectangular watch with a round movement. Yeah. So assuming you can fit a round movement into a a rectangular watch, why is IWC creating a rectangular movement here? Well, having just gotten into wristwatches and wanting to create new movements, it was kind of natural to be like, well, we're going to make this square watch and we'll make a square movement to go in it. Uh, I guess that probably made more sense at the time than trying to fit a round peg into a square hole. Yeah, yeah. And it was always round pocket watches. Yeah. There, I I can't think of a, a pocket watch movement that wasn't round. Even in the square cases, they were round movements. Huh. So when they went for the wrist watches and you went into these uh, square cases back in that time, they would actually make a movement for it that fit the case. It's... um. It's it's a really weird and cool looking movement. I mean, I really think there's something off about looking at this kind of square movement. It just looks so weird. It yeah. looks like you took a round movement and put it in a Squished vice. <laughs> yeah. Um, in, uh, odd note on square watches. My friend Carl Ruiz, who is a genius, says that women prefer men in square watches to round watches, and that that is because women associate round with fat and square the vertically square orientation with thinness and his his empirical evidence of this is wearing his cartier santos and or his um frank Mueller to the to the bar versus wearing like a blingy round watch that's huh. his that's his reference and i i would think like round would be a little more feminine because of all the soft edges yeah whereas square would be more masculine yeah like a cuff right? almost. yeah i but, don't know but i'm gonna wear this frank Mueller for a month see and what I'll, happens i will circle back to you on that one but that is the uh chef carl ruiz life advice that i typically i listen to he's not usually wrong <laughs> um, 1936 now all right so now now that we've gotten through 15 minutes of the computer not freezing. We are past where we were before. Yeah. That, the square movement. We've is, made it. The computer took a crap at the square movement. Now we're it back. It couldn't understand it either. Now we're back. 1936, IWC's first ever special pilot's watch. Um, it featured a rotating bezel, uh, so you could mark your flight times using a, an arrow. And uh, it had an anti-magnetic escapement. And uh, this is where we're going to start getting into watches that like start to look familiar um, like IWC. And in fact, this 1936 Pilot's Watch looks like they could drop this at Basel World like this year. Right. It looks like current IWC technology, uh, not technology, but um, a, a visual language. Yeah, and I think that uh, the rotating bezel with the um, with the arrow on the crystal... The arrow's on the crystal. So it's really actually the cool. whole crystal that rotates. Uh, yeah, it's the whole... It's kind of like... Uh, the old Navitimers, yeah. the whole crystal and bezel rotates on that slide rule. Yeah. So the whole front thing is just on there, and it rotates. So it's just literally just painted on the crystal. But it'd be, I think it would be cool to have something like that reissue. I think that'd be a very cool reissue yeah. feature, yeah. Uh, who knows if this thing is remotely watertight, I'm this guessing. This one, no. Yeah, not a chance, no. right? Um, you could make it watertight today, though. I'm sure they could figure out how to do that easily. So that that is the first special pilot's watch, but this the pilot's watch... This is not when they first started selling them. This was like a, like a the a, first actual model. The first production. actual yeah. one. Yeah, this wasn't the first like big deal thing. Nineteen thirty nine brings us the Portuguese watch, and uh, why is it called Portuguese? Well, because two importers from Portugal ordered them. Ah, That's exactly. I never knew that. It's literally called that <laughs> because the first two orders for these watches, this watch was only developed because a Portuguese importer said, "I would like you to take a pocket watch movement." Uh, a very one, your most precise pocket watch movement, and make it into a dress wristwatch for us to sell in Portugal. Hence the IWC Portugueser, which do we have one? We do, don't we? Uh, we do. We have a current. We have the current Portugueser. We can show you. Um, we have a. We don't have any of the super old IWCs. We have no. we have current well, versions of a lot of the classics. 
We know. No, we have. A, I have another. Another. Another one for that. Okay. That comes later. This Here is Portuguese. This is the chronograph version. This is the current one. How do we get Ooh. so close in there? I don't know. We can zoom out. I will zoom out. No. Nope. Or do I need? You, gotta, to, move you need this to physically back. move the thing up. Yeah. There. Right about All there. Right. There we go. Sorry for our lack of preparation. We got we got totally we got flustered. flustered by and can you turn down the uh, the darkness on that one because the dials glow in a bit. Yeah, there we go. I want to see it like that. So here's the Portuguese. It's um, it's not totally a dress watch, but it's it's definitely dressy er. It's on. It leans dressy. Yeah, it's for a, sure. But it's still um. I feel like you could still wear this with a t-shirt and jeans and not Definitely. look totally out of place. Good yeah. versatile versatile watch. Um I mean the blue hands like that, the the blue steel hands and the um the polished surfaces on the case, it definitely dresses it up enough. Yeah. But it's it's still like a sport watch, I would say. Solid case back, chronograph. It's you know the sportier side of dress watches. Yeah, that's good. Could flip that back over. That's the kind of watch uh, you'd want a perfect case back for engraving something. You know. Yeah. Con- congrats on your graduation, right? Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is. Whatever's going in there. Uh, that's the Portugueser. It's a beautiful watch. 1940, the first ever big pilot's watch with a central seconds hand. So when I, as I've been reading about this histories, Cameron, is the central seconds hand. Something that us modern watch folk take for granted. What's the big deal with a central seconds hand? Central second hand is, it it was a very complex feature. Why was it so complex? So you already have a wheel off to the side of the the watch uh, in the gear train. In the gear train, yeah. That is spinning one time every minute. Like you, the, the movement has its own sort of natural yeah. seconds hand. Exactly, it has yeah. a natural second hand. You don't need to add any parts. Just put a hole in the dial well, and put a stick on the pin. Exactly, <laughs> have a longer pivot on one side of that wheel, and a hole in your dial, and it just goes through, and you put a hand on it. That's so it. So that was the the sub second hand. And that's, I mean, your that's what your watch is. Yeah, yeah. Your sure. your watch has has a small seconds hand. We'll go back here. Here's the Weiss watch at the nine o'clock position. Small yeah. seconds hand. And nice. all we do is underneath this jewel right here, mm-hmm. we actually have a wheel that has a longer pinion that goes through the dial, and you and press it. a hand on there. And that and that wheel would be there and doing the thing that it does, whether there's Regardless. a dial on it or not. Yeah. Okay, so we go from that to central seconds hand. What's, what's the big deal there? So central second hand, in order to do that, you actually have to drill a hole all the way through the, the pinion that your minute and hour hand go on to. Okay, so you're using you're now using a hollow pinion there. You have a hollow pinion and it's a very long pinion that you're drilling a tiny little hole through. You're then placing a very long thin pinion through it. And on the back side you add a wheel and another bridge and it makes it much more complex. You're adding like five different parts. Yeah. And you also have these really long tiny drill holes and tiny pivots that if they're not perfect, it's, it's just a big it's gonna problem. Have, it's going to stop your watch. Yeah. So it it was one of those things that it's like, why do it? Yeah. You know, until someone decided that they could actually do it successfully, and it wasn't going to cause the watch not to work, right, or cause issues. That's when it it became a little more normal when manufacturing standards kind of got up to that level. Uh, we have the modern version of the of a big pilot's watch, which I think is a is a really pretty watch. I mean, just it's bold and easy to read, and it, it's it looks like a quality item, but it's definitely not flashy and in your face. I'm such a big fan of that watch. Like, yeah, I don't like have the desire to go out and spend five grand. Oh, wait, how much is this thing? Big Pilot seventy seven fifty. Um, you know, personally, but it, I, every time I see someone else wearing one, I go, "That looks good on you." Yeah. Well, um, and they've got the seven day power reserve. Yeah, uh, that this on this particular one, there's a power reserve gauge at the three yeah. o'clock position. Yeah, um, I love power reserve gauge. It's such a nice thing to have, especially if you have a seven day power reserve. Hell yeah! Like, and for you, you've got the perpetual. With, with the so perpetual, I don't keep that. I don't keep that on a winder typically. Yeah. I I wear it at least two or three days out of every seven, and that's then sufficient. You be fine. Yeah. 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 Um, but if you go back, like there's actually a lot of other companies right now. Like I think there's quite a few companies like Sin. And Alpina and a, pu- a bunch of these like 
nice, you know, Swiss, not crazy hot whatever, but like nice companies that make something that looks almost exactly like the original IWC Pilots watch. Yeah, that's it was it's a very iconic watch. It's so yeah. there's a lot of brands that created watches like it at that time uh, and a lot that didn't exist at that time and they are now creating designs yeah. like that but big time uh, potential for reissue just because it's so iconic. Yeah, and beautiful watch and the current one, I, there's a lot of different versions of the current Big Pilot. You can get it yeah. in different face colors and different special editions and whatever. This one is the uh, the simple black white automatic date 7 day 770 bucks. So Seven seven thousand seven hundred fifty bucks at uh, at Crown and Caliber. Okay, so now next turning point. Now we're at uh, nineteen forty five World War Two, um, and uh, pre- oh, that's nineteen fifty. Um, so in nineteen forty four, uh, IWC's first ever uh, military watch, field watch. So something about. Why is this picture so like faded? Does that just look like it's, just it's, a, it's probably from an old catalog. It's just and an old just catalog picture. In. Okay, yeah. yeah, not the best picture, but uh, they put the the three W's on the back. WWW, which says watch wrist <laughs> waterproof. Yeah, that's that's the old WWW. <laughs> Real, <yeah. laughs> Real genius marketing uh, back there. Um, and in 1944, a guy named Albert Peloton. Uh, takes up the post, as they say, as technical director at IWC. He was at Vacheron before. Yes. Uh, he. So the thing that we know him for with IWC is that winding mechanism that we spoke about uh, when we were showing I have, another I have, episode where we had a ton well, of... Well, uh, there's one on the back of that. Right? It's, it's, yeah. basically, it's basically when your automatic winding rotor that winds both ways, right? Isn't that what this, what this is? What is it? It winds both ways, but doing it without reversing wheels. So instead of having a the the standard clutching mechanism that like Rolex was using, right? Um, they have these two paws that. Let me grab a pointer here, and I'll point these. Get parts a pointer. Out. I got you on the big screen, buddy. Yeah. We're full. This is the back of my IWC, and I almost want to wear it inside out. It's so pretty. So and yours has the ceramic ones, I believe. These white ceramic paws right here. Uh huh. And this is the wheel that they're interacting with. And this as little, yeah. as the oscillating weight spins around, let's see if we can. Might be a little hard. I mean, but, we're talking about very small things. Yeah, here. yeah. It, it's tiny. But as that oscillating weight kind of goes back and forth, uh-huh. the ratchet pulls. If you watch them as you shake your watch, they just will engage either way. Engage either way on that wheel to keep it from unwinding. Huh. Yeah. So it's a it's a simultaneous winding and like unwinding lockout exactly, mechanism. It, it's pulling the wheel. And locking, pulling the wheel and mm-hmm. locking, um, whereas a reversing wheel is actually a kind of similar system, but it's Isn't inside. a reversing wheel more like you'd find on like the gears of a bicycle, where you could pedal one way, and if you go the other way, it does nothing? Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's more like that. Yeah. Cool. Or like the winding crown in your watch. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. And so with this, the, the, the big benefit of this is that uh, the angular movement of the oscillating weight, less... Uh, angular movement is required for the same amount of wind. Okay, so, so a for quarter every one turn degree, gets you more yeah. wind than it does in a, another comparable watch. So even watch. if you barely move your arms yeah. and you're just like sitting typing at a computer, this watch will wind more efficiently than a watch that has reversing wheels that needs more angular movement right. of your arms to wind it. Okay, well, we we just jumped ahead 10 years by accident because he hasn't invented that yet. We have to oh. go back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he gets the job in 44. He doesn't he doesn't invent that movement until 1950. But we will get there. So back in time. Back in time. Um, <laughs> then here we go. Uh, the In 1946, Peloton designs uh, the 89 caliber movement with a central seconds hand, very high accuracy. In 1948... And actually, go back to that because go, you go. can see the central second hand thing here. Oh, yeah. Okay, where are we looking? Um, right here. Right you've here. You've got this spring, and it's a really fine spring. I'm holding the mouse over it at the moment there. That yeah. then goes underneath this bridge. Okay. And this bridge has a second jewel in it. So there's a jewel, a cap that's jewel. It's like a double stack. Yeah. yeah. So you've got this cap jewel that's holding this long pinion that goes all the way through the watch to the dial side uh-huh. and holds your second hand. The spring is putting pressure on it so that it doesn't jump around as you move. Uh, and then underneath it, you have another jewel 
that the pinion for the center wheel that drives your hour and minute hands is underneath there. So it's a lot of things stacked, and that's why it was a um, considered complex at the time. It's it's very beautiful. Yeah. Very beautiful. 48 IWC Pilot's Watch Mark 11 with uh, the new uh, Peloton 89 caliber and it has a uh, it has a soft iron inner case. It's like an anti-magnetic kind of case, but the wording leads me to believe that that was discovered almost by accident. Uh uh, unusually high protection against magnetic fields, it says. And that wording to me means they weren't really expecting that to happen. Yeah, well, they didn't know exactly how how much it right. shielded, I guess. Right. And then here's Mr. Albert Peloton, 1950. He uh, invents his automatic winding mechanism, which uh, we just showed you. And it's a proprietary uh, development at the time. And it literally influences every movement they've made ever since. So, continuing on. Hans Ernst Humberger. Now, uh, this says he becomes the company's last private owner. Is he the is he the son? Is he related to Ernst Jacob Hamburger, or is he a different Hamburger? They never make it clear if they are in the same family or not. Huh? They they might not be. Then I always thought that it was. Yeah. Yeah. We you was I mean you you got to kind of assume right yeah. two guys named Hamburger consecutively running the company, and I'm sure one of the commenters will let us know, but yeah. IWC themselves make no claim <laughs> that this guy's <laughs> related to the guy before him. Uh, and, of course, in 55, they also launched the Ingenue, uh, and then 59, they have their first ever women's uh, automatic women's watch. Uh, and you can see on the left here, there's a square one. Although, is that a round movement in a square case there, Cameron? I think at that time it is. It, yeah, it, by I then think, it became yep. then, yeah. Uh, 67, the Aqua Timer. 67 is like, oh, with watches, is like 1955 in Back to the Future. <laughs> Everything happens in 67. It's yeah. like the Sea Dweller, the Sea Seamaster Professional, the Aqua Timer. It's like all dive watches came into being really around 67. Yeah. Uh, the, the very deep dive watches. Um, yeah. The My 5512 that I've got is uh, from 1967. From 67 yep. is like such a pivotal year in dive watches. Like every major brand had like a new, dope, iconic, you know, watch for 67. Yeah. Um, 1969, we go with the, the, the Quartz Crisis, the right. Beta 21. Uh, if we go back, we discussed many episodes back the beta 21 you want to give us a give us a reminder on beta 21 the beta 21 was actually a group of companies that got together to develop a quartz movement that would hopefully keep them uh, um, at least on par with what was going on in asia with uh, with seiko um, that was the hopes yeah and create a swiss made quartz watch so the Beta 21 you'll see pops up in a lot of different brands yeah. all at the same time uh, right when it was developed. And it it did help. I mean, oh, it, yeah. Yeah, it, it did keep did. a lot of these yeah. brands alive. Yeah, for a period um, of time, it it, uh, it helped out. Yeah. Uh, Rolex's dissatisfaction with that led them to do their own quartz yeah. movement, which you could get up until, what was it, 2003 or something? You yeah. could get it like real recently. Yeah. And you can still buy, you know, actually... Oyster quartzes for twenty five hundred bucks aren't aren't such bad looking watches. Yeah, um, seventy six the Ingenue SL. Um, we have uh, not discussed Ingenue yet, but we have a new one. Do you want to? We actually that'll come around later. Yeah. Leave that Ingenue. Uh, and then in seventy seven, um, seventy seven is like deep into the quartz crisis, right? You have to. It's I got the impression from reading about this that by seventy seven. IWC was like, all right, we can't survive making these pilots' watches and these kind of tool watches. We're going to do this quartz thing and try and do that, go low end and try and get that volume. And then at the other end, we are going to make the craziest, most complicated, most ornate, most expensive shit we possibly can yeah. and hope somebody will buy it. Yeah. Um, well, you had, uh, I don't know what the year was, and they probably won't mention it here. But you had, uh, so when IWC went from being uh, a family-owned private company, they were purchased by 
uh, VDO. VDO, which right? was in 1978. Okay, I was getting so the to next that the year. following okay. year. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll get there next. We will get there. <laughs> so right. So in '77, they developed their own complications. First pocket watch with a calendar, moon phase, um, and they do uh, some other complications as well. Now VDO for uh, for you car folks out there. Uh, you may recognize VDO if you've ever been in a, a German car from the 60s through the I, 80s. I took the Beetle in uh, today. It's a 59, and it's VDO. got video gauges. Check it out. Here's a 1969 Porsche set of VDO uh, gauges. You can see right here on video between the temp and the oil pressure gauge there. It says, it says VDO right on it. Super, super common. Look, here's a VDO clock, probably made by fucking IWC. Now, at that time... VDO was also they had ownership of uh, JLC, correct? Uh, I didn't. I don't know. Possibly, don't know. I I think it was either at that time or it might have been at the same time when they took over IWC. They got into JLC as well. Uh, it could be. If so, I, it didn't come up in my research, but yeah. it's totally possible. But you had the the Jager gauges too yeah you had i mean you had the jj gauges for the italian cars yeah. and then the vdo gauges for the german cars yeah. that was typically how it went like lambo alpha maserati ferrari had the jj gauges and then porsche and, and uh my land rover and land rover too <laughs> yeah. oh cool yeah and yeah. oh and jaguar in the 50s and 60s as well had, okay. had it as well so the, but the then Brits- vdo was porsche mercedes uh volkswagen audi possibly BMW, don't recall. Yeah. Possibly. Uh, yes, I think if you go back to the 2002 BMW, yes. Okay. Either way, there's like, a, at this point, like mid-70s, late-70s, there's a heavy car watch crossover going on. Yeah. Um, and including the uh, collaborations between IWC and F.A. Porsche for his first watches, such as this one here we've got, I forget what the hell it's called. It's got a compass in it. It has a compass in it, yeah. like an actual compass in it, which is the first ever time uh, uh, they did right, that. It, it flips open, and then there's a compass in the, yeah. uh, the back part of it. And yeah. It kind of pops off the wrist. It's cool. And this is this was before uh, F.A. Porsche designed this before the company Porsche Design was a thing. Yeah. Like, it, I or think... it, no, I'm sorry. Porsche Design was a thing, but they were doing like luggage and stuff before this. This was their first ever like technological thing. Yeah. Uh, and then that led to IWC producing the Porsche Design Titan chronograph, which is the first ever chronograph in a titanium yeah, case. which w- is nuts. It's cool. Right? It's w- so weird to think that before 1980, there were not titanium watches. Yeah. Like, it, it's like a it, lot you take for granted. Yeah. Um, same thing as next week when we talk about dive watches. There's a lot that there's a lot of stuff I take for granted in modern yeah. watches that I didn't think about as yeah. well either. Yeah. It's, um, it's tough to machine. Titanium. It's very. It's a very hard material. It takes twice as long to machine that, as stainless. And it's milled. Uh, and it, it's not really cast ever, right? Uh, it should be milled. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For for a case, it should be milled. Um, I'm not sure if if uh, how stamping processes go to stamp out like a a near knit kind of blank and then machine it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, very hard material. To, it's a cool watch. Have you ever make. seen one of these Titans in person? It's a neat looking watch. I have not seen one in person. I saw one at uh, one of those like watch nerd parties yeah <laughs> yeah uh there's another one coming up with mod blanc we're gonna we got, uh, we i get saw. the invite yeah, yeah i'm gonna go with red bar shout yeah. out to red bar if you want to go to like watch nerd gatherings that are more fun than other watch nerd gatherings yeah red bar is a good time it was um let's see where are we 1982 this cool thing in 1982 this is like a demo watch this is called the ocean 2000 Early 80s, it started getting real crazy with how deep you can send your watch. That became a real big yeah. thing. The the, ex, the the finding of the Titanic, the exploring of the Marianas Trench, uh, people doing crazy free diving shit. Um, so this Ocean 2000 Divers watch could go to 200 bar. Okay. Yeah, which is absolutely insane. If you're not doing that math right now in your head, I did it for you. That's six thousand six hundred and ninety-one feet. Yeah. <laughs> we so in the watch industry, a typical uh, pressure chamber. Yeah. For dry testing a watch, is it goes to ten bar. <laughs> so I hook it up to my air compressor, yeah. and I'm I'm putting uh, like eleven and a half to twelve bar into the machine. So a good, a good a uh, rule of, of thumb conversion for that is uh, 10 meters per bar. One bar is 10 meters, give or take. 
right? Yeah, uh, 10 bar is going to be uh, 330 feet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, nah, why don't I say give or take? It is. Or it is. It's exact. Yes. Isn't yes. a bar an atmosphere? Yeah, 33. So it's 33 right, so, feet yeah. if you're scuba diving is yeah. one atmosphere. I don't want to dwell on it because we got a whole <laughs> yeah, episode another... next week on dive watches, and as a scuba diver myself, I can't wait to do that one. Yeah. 1985, uh, the first perpetual calendar chronograph. Um, I have one of these. If you want to flip mine over, and uh, yours, I, mine is, is the mo- oh no, mine's the modern one. Mine's a different one. I'm sorry. Yeah. First perpetual. Uh, so so they invented the four year digit display in '85. And uh, this mechanic calendar is mechanically programmed for the next 500 years. And the I think one of the most one of the awesome things about IWC, and I think it stems from them being started by an American trying to make Swiss watches and sell them to Americans. They still do this today, which is awesome to stay true to it. But uh, I think the development of the crown where you can set the perpetual mechanism through the crown. Mm-hmm. Super simple. Is that hard to break things? Is you that don't the have only person, the only company that does that? Um, as far as I know, yeah. Oh, okay. I, yeah. I took it for granted. This is the only one of these I'm familiar yeah. with. Otherwise, so. you're going to be pressing all the the pushers, and you have to you have this little stylus, and you have to make sure you do everything at the right time. And the IWC is so easy to set. It's very hard to mess things up. Unbelievable design, and it wasn't designed from the ground up. What do you they mean? They took a 7750 movement. Oh, an really? Edda 7750 movement and they created this on top of the Edda 7750. Oh, they so this thing must have been movement. thick. It's a thick watch. T H I C C thick. Yeah, and and they created this amazingly complex watch on a solid workhorse movement so that you could have this simple watch that's easier to fix. Right. Uh, that's a workhorse. And you it's have all these crazy features. Yeah. It was like, totally, uh, totally new for the time. How interesting. Yeah. Well, that's very cool. 1986, they begin using ceramic cases. Here we have an example of what I believe is a ceramic case with gold hardware perpetual yeah. calendar, which, fuck me, does that say 80s on it, doesn't it? <laughs> right? <laughs> this, thing, though, this thing looks like the watch that Dan Aykroyd would be trying to pawn in go- trading places, but this is a Rosh Foucault. <laughs> <laughs> it simultaneously tells time in Gestad. It's, um, it's black and gold. That's what you need to know about this watch from 86. It's black and gold. <laughs> in 87, they made a square perpetual calendar, which, if you ask me, it's just heinous looking, honestly. The eight, the late 80s were not kind to, to IWC's design department. Uh, 1990, they create a grand complication, um, which uh, had, had before 1990, had no one made a grand complication watch before? Oh, uh, everyone was making grand complications. Oh, okay. So this is a... has made a grand complication every single year since like 1800 oh, something. All right. So this were I I I, yeah. bought, I bought into a little bit of no, IWC for... marketing. They were never really known as a complicated watches company. Their whole history was not about being complex. Right. So for them to achieve this was very big because it showed that they were able to invest in the watchmaking side of it and and they had a great team of watchmakers and designers, movement engineers, the whole thing. So it was, for them, a big step into a different type of market. Huh. Very cool. 93. Uh, here is, uh, they produce uh, what is, the at the time, the world's most complicated mechanical watch called Il Destriero, wait, <laughs> Il Destriero Scafusia, which is the something destroyer. Right? Uh, yeah. The uh, no, the War Horse of Schaffhausen. Oh, the War Horse of Schaffhausen. That's what that means. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, it is. Uh, it's got. Let's see. Several complications, including a tourbillon, split seconds, minute repeater, perpetual calendar, um, and they also is. There's a new series of uh, Portugueseers. Uh, we actually have the uh, the minute. We have a minute repeater. So, all right. We've got here. Wait. We'll skip to here. Whoop. There we go. 1995, IWC releases the Portugueser uh, Chrono Ratroponte, as an which is a, a split seconds chronograph and also the minute repeater. So, do you want to give us a quick primer on minute repeaters? 
Okay, so the minute repeater is like a grandfather clock that chimes. It chimes. So the reason this was necessary for clocks was because you weren't always around your clock. It was a stationary thing. It was not on your wrist. So you wanted to hear from the other room or before that from across town what time it was. So it would chime yeah, off the, the time. In the case of the church, yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. So you have a low-pitched gong for your hours. Then you have a low high for your quarter hours. And then you have a high pitch for your minutes. And if it is one sixteen, you would get one low gong. Uh huh. Dong. Then, yeah, and then you'd get one high low. Dong dong. Yeah, or it might be low ding, high, ding. something like yeah. And then dong, you would get dong, your, uh, <laughs> and then you would get your, uh, uh, your high pitch ding. for that remaining minute that makes dong, sixteen. Dong, dong, ding. <laughs> oh my god! You have to like learn a musical language for this shit, and it's it's slower than you're doing it. It's like you dun, know, dun, 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 dun. okay, yeah. yeah, okay. Anyway, well, here's where I'm we disappoint deaf, the so. audience. We have this beautiful watch. Crown and Caliber just got it on trade. It's made of platinum. It's really heavy. It's really pretty. It was a hundred and ten thousand dollars when it was new in who knows when, sometime between 1995 and now. The chimes aren't working. I'm sorry. I want you to hear it, but they're not working. <laughs> Crown and Caliber has to service it. I'm sorry. We tried. <laughs> yeah. It's uh it's a bit of a bummer. It's a shame cuz it, it it really is kind of one of the the pinnacles of watchmaking. If you could imagine back in the day not having lights, yeah. not having loom on the hands of a watch, it wasn't invented yet, and being so wealthy and powerful, that you had somebody make you commission to watch that you could just pull a slide, like this little slide here on the side, you pull it down and release it, and it will chime off the sound so that you don't have to light a candle to read it off. It's super, super yeah. pimp. I wish it worked. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry it doesn't, folks. I really am. Um, in 1998, IWC comes out with their GS... Oops, that's... Oh, where are we? Sorry, here. 97, the GST sports watch line, which was, uh, you know, like 20 years after the Titan chronograph. But boy, does it look awfully similar, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. It's a it's a nice looking watch. But like, I don't know. This watch to me is not a, about what IWC is about. I don't know. It doesn't speak to me. I think for for modern IWC. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's relatively new. It's not like the, the Portuguese or... Uh... I mean, it's 20 years old at this point, and I don't think it's necessarily aged that well. Let's just say that. Yeah. But it could be a good entry entry into this. Uh, the Pilot's Watch UTC comes out in 1998, um, which uh, has a quick set hour for jumping time zones. And I think UTC is basically GMT, but their brand, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Universal Mean Time and Greenwich Mean Time. Yeah. Uh, so what was it? You had the... Well, right. Isn't this... Is this the... Right here, look, if you look at so the it's, dial. It's technically not Greenwich Mean Time anymore. Yeah. Because no, why does everybody care that it's Greenwich? You yeah. Know? Nobody cares. So it went to Universal. Um, and then, is it something else or is it still just Universal? I'm I sure a pilot still, would know. This is Universal Time Coordinated. Yeah. So this watch has a 24-hour clock within the dial that's like a digital 24-hour clock. It's kind of neat, actually. And uh, this is the first time i think we see metal uh, steel bands on these things too right uh no no because you had the dive watch uh, oh, that's true what am i the, talking about i don't know I yeah just, uh-oh we think we uh we're back no no it, i just it, i thought it froze for I a thought, second yeah. but it did not you scared me uh, <laughs> um and then uh we go to the dive watches uh but so 1999 they come out with this thing called gst deep one which has a mechanical depth gauge in it. Right. I have always wanted one of these. They are, they, these are really cool. It's a good-looking yeah. watch. And again, we have a whole episode on dive watches coming up, and we will we will come back to this one with uh, their mechanical yeah. uh, depth gauge. Um, I, they were the first people to do that, right? I think, yeah. This, I, uh, I think this was. Yeah, the Deep One yeah. is the first watch to do that. Um, now let's. Uh, we'll, we're going to bump it up. In the year two thousand, this happens. 
the 5,000 caliber. And now we can go back to my perpetual, which is based on the 5,000 caliber. It's a seven-day movement power reserve based on the Peloton winding system, and it is meant for large watch cases like the big pilots. And there it is. Um, so this movement started in 2000, and they, they still make it today. It's the basis of most of the higher-end big pilot watches. So let's actually step back, because here I'm, I just saw the Richemont uh, taken over by Richemont. Mm -hmm. That's but, the other thing that happened in 2000. Yeah. Before that, though, you had... Uh, so you had VDO, which at the time owned... Uh, prior to this, owned JLC, uh -huh. and also IWC. They ended up going to um, LMH. So LMH purchased... IWC and JLC. Right. And then they restarted Longa. Oh. So LMH was a huge deal. Yeah. Without them, we would not have JLC, IWC, Longa. And if we didn't have JLC, we wouldn't have AP. Yeah. <laughs> we wouldn't have a lot of... Uh, a lot of watches depend on JLC movements in yeah. the higher end realm. Uh, so they were really important. Um, that's uh, Gunter Bloomline. Yeah, was the the CEO uh, of LMH, and he was there. You go. There you go. And this Gunter he was there Blumlein. And, uh, yeah. Now this looks like a guy who's here to sell watches. That's this is a guy who's who's yeah. definitely into. He's, he's got the right he's watch up look. There with uh, Nicholas Nicholas Hayek from the Swatch Group. Um, he was a big time heavy hitter that kept the watch industry ticking when it needed it most. Huh. How cool. Yeah. 2004, uh, they relaunched the AquaTimer, and we have a modern AquaTimer, actually, don't we? we the Galapagos? Do. I wanted to borrow this um, one. Well, we've got... We've, we've got this. that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, we have this one, too. Okay, so this is... Which is pictured there. Yeah, so we, we have this one, <laughs> which is straight off the website. i got to move this up because it's on the bracelet. Okay, cool. There we go. All right. This is a very pretty watch. Um... Not is it? It is a dive watch, right? This is a dive. It watch. is a dive watch, yes. right? And what's cool about this one, as uh, Cameron will demonstrate, it's got really great thick hands. Like if you remember the old B five Audi S four, it had really thick gauge needles that I really liked. Very bright, good loom, and then spin the. Uh, it's got an internal bezel, so the bezel is inside the crystal, and, and you as you spin see, it, if you go backwards, it's get, still unidirectional. Yeah, if you go backwards. There's a clutch mechanism that uncouples. <clears throat> If you go forward, there you, you go. Can push it forward. So there's a reason for that. Yes. All dive bezels are one way dive bezels. And now, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> once they now they are. Once people started dying, yeah, <laughs> from fuck ups. And again, we I I, I don't want to dwell on the ins and outs of diving. We will stick to it. But this Aqua Timer came out in uh, in 04. and then we also have. Um, these are popular. You know, my friend Chris Harris wears an Aqua Timer. He wears one that's more like this one. Here's the um, is it, this is it? Isn't this the Galapagos one? Yeah. But yes. Here's the Galapagos Charles Darwin one. Chris, uh, Chris Harris wears one like this. I should have bummed this when I went to the Galapagos. Um, yeah. These are pretty, and this, this one's is, like got that rubberized. I don't know. Is it? It's pretty what? lightweight, right? But it's, it's got the rubberized coating. Yeah, the whole case has this sort of rubberized yeah. coating on it. I don't know it. if it's, it's really titanium nice. with rubberized coating. I don't think it's titanium because it's heavy, but here, what's it's Galapagos. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, is it titanium? It is pretty heavy, yeah. actually. It's a good value, $3,550, yeah. actually, for a for a, a water sports ready IWC yeah. um, sport watch. And then it's got the little uh, the the uh, tortoise on the back. Yeah. The large, uh, uh, Jesus, giant tortoise. Um, so that's Aqua Timer, 05. Now, we, a oh. cool thing about these guys, mm -hmm. um, if I can do it here. Hang on, let me zoom out here. You're just really going. Ooh, hold on, let me. What are you let doing? Me, you go ahead. What are you I'll... doing? Oh, you you mess you messing with it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, 05, It's the Ingenieur, uh, and the uh, the relaunch of the Ingenieur, uh, which we discussed with uh, when we had uh, Marco uh, Girassi and Craniotes on. Marco had his Ingenieur that I really liked. That's like. All right. If you wanted something that was similar to an AP Royal Oak, but different. What do you got there, Cameron? So IWC, uh -huh. one important feature of an IWC are these quick change straps. And they've oh. been doing this for a long time now. They've been well known for it. Here, hang on. I'm zooming in. There's a little button here, this little metal thing. 
yeah. spring loaded. You basically pull it down, and this one hasn't come off in a while, so it's a little sticky. A little sticky. But we'll just show us on I the got other this strap. one. Yeah. And this spring loaded thing cool. allows it to unsnap without any tools. Oh neat. Right? Yeah. Pretty I, cool. bet, I bet that's good if you're uh, if you're traveling, you bring multiple straps, you don't have to change a tool, you exactly. can do it. Exactly. If you're going in and out of water, that kind of thing. Yeah, and then uh oh, you find something else. Over same there? thing. Oh, same thing on the metal one? The metal ones. Oh, neat. You've got these little buttons here. I don't know if you can see in you the You can in the links. center links, yeah, the buttons. The Are those quick links? pop out buttons. Yeah, quick really? pop out, yeah. Cool. So you can change these as well because you could have put this on a rubber strap. Oh, that's really uh, it's practical. It's a neat feature and it's something they've been doing for a long time. That's super yeah. practical. Yeah. Uh, so 05, the Ingenieur, and we spent about 30 minutes on the Ingenieur uh, with, not 30 minutes, but at least 10 to 15. Um, and then 06, we've got the modern version of the Big Pilot, which you, uh, which we talked about before. Uh, that's the Big Pilot as we know it today, began in 2006. We're almost at today. In 2000, <laughs> we're almost at today. 2007, they opened uh, the IWC Museum in Schaffhausen. Uh, you can uh, go visit it. I haven't been. Have you been? Uh, I have not been to that one, but I was actually in the Netherlands, and there there was, when I was there many years ago, uh, there was a museum that you could walk through there. Really? I don't know what the significance was. It might have just been like a boutique style with a museum ah, attached. I'm going to Amsterdam very soon. In 2011, we got the most uh, complicated IWC ever uh, made called it's got a fun name too. Wait, it's called the Sid. Wait, Sidrate. Where is it? Si, uh, I wrote it down. Wait, <laughs> Sidrate Scafusia, which is the most complex. Oh, there we go. Sidorale. Sidorale. Yeah. Sidorale. I was reading my own handwriting, which was shit. Uh, a patented constant force tourbillon with numerous complications and individually calculated astronomically displays. Yeah. What does that mean? That means that <laughs> this watch is made. For you and where you live exactly. <laughs> you I I knew uh I knew somebody who purchased one and it yeah. is like an honor to go through and, and be offered, I guess, to to purchase one. So of what these do watches. you do? You give them your coordinates of you, your house? You visit with them, uh you come up with you know, like dial what dial style you want. I I'm pretty sure it's a, a very bespoke timepiece where you have a lot of decisions to make, and then you're also giving them your address, and they're getting the coordinates, and then the whole... It's unbelievable. Because Probably really hard to evade stuff. taxes in that one. Because uh, yeah. <laughs> you can't have them ship the empty box to right? the other state. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it, it's an insanely complex watch. There's videos on YouTube. If you Google the, the name, uh, Siderale Scafusha or whatever... Uh, you can take a look at it, but it really does require the video. <laughs> <laughs> you have to watch the video. It's it's complex. It's super ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, we're almost at today. We're getting very close. In 2013, um, IWC collaborated with the a Mercedes AMG Petronas Formula One team to give us a line of watches uh, inspired by, themed as, whatever the uh, in, in collaboration with AMG. Um, I actually had to be honest with you. This is a very pretty watch. This Ingenieur. I, I don't think Marco was a fan of this current generation of Ingenieur, but have, now holding this thing in person, this is a dope watch. What it's do you think? nice, but I really loved the previous generation. The silver I, one. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I love the. Uh, it was a little more boxy. Yeah. The the the, the this one is they've this rounded one, yeah, off. They've got more round edges. The the movement is a really cool uh, decoration with the black oscillating weight. Um, and just like the gray uh, coating on the bridges. Yeah, I mean, I like I'm I like that for an all black watch. I think it's pretty cool. All yeah. black isn't typically my thing, but I think it's it's a neat watch. And I like that it doesn't say fucking Mercedes right on the dial. Like if you turn yeah. it over, it says like a what does it say AMG black on the back there? Yeah, down right here. here AMG black. But like, I mean, you literally flip it back over. You literally have to take the watch off. To get yeah. that, or wait, what does it say at under above the six? There, does it say something? 
Uh, no, no, it's just the... the it's engineer. an ingenieur? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So no, nothing on the dial to indicate a, a corporate partnership with AMG, right? Yeah. That's how it should be. <laughs> I don't want to see the fucking Ferrari logo on the thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? But uh, if you actually, if you get a new AMG car, as we pointed out in our Cars and Watches episode, um, the dial design of this ingenieur is similar to the Mercedes AMG clock. Lastly... This is it. We end it today. We end at right now with... Oh, wait. Hang on. Sorry. We have to go all the way back to... Where's the Jubilee collection? Because it is now mm-hmm. 2018, and here we are, uh, 150th anniversary, and they now have a 150 years collection. So they have a series of the uh, Paul Webers, both in pocket watch and wristwatch. They have... Uh, commemorative edition Portugueseers and the price tags on these fucking things. This one's a value at two hundred and fifty grand. Damn! Constant force. It's, what is it's the constant? Got, what's the constant force, Torbjorn? So constant force is keeping the torque that's coming from the the mainspring and the barrel. Uh huh. It keeps the torque constant whether it's fully wound or only partially wound. Oh, so it will it won't slowly die yeah. off over time and get you less notice, accurate uh, as the movement yeah, gets. Yeah. Like take a look at this this uh IWC mm-hmm. here. Uh-huh. And you've got your power reserve dial over here. Yeah. Right it's now showing we're about at three, two and a half, two and a half yeah. days, yeah. When it gets under Two? Yeah. You see what the dial goes red? Yeah, it's got like that? a like a fuel reserve gauge That's there. That's basically saying I'm not accurate right now. Oh. At so, least they tell you. Yeah. That's good. So the know. last like day or two, it's not accurate. Wow, it so here's going, the difference. Look, if you go back to the constant force, is this a power reserve here? Or is that a date? I can't see from over here. Um Is there a, is that power reserve or date? Can you tell? That might be power reserve, the number of hours, right? Oh wow! How snobby they put it in hours. It's an eighty-hour power, ninety hours. That's very snobby, but that's also kind of gangster. And there's no red line. There's yeah. no, the constant force goes right to the exactly. end. Exactly. It should be good until that's it stops. Very pimp. So these. This is what's happening at IWC right now. Portugueser, you know, very expensive, very expensive. You can actually get a nice Portugueser chronograph like the we one we have here. here. Yeah. Um, there we go. What is that? That's uh, seventy-seven fifty. That's close to the anniversary one. Pretty cool. Um, and then, I mean, look, they make a lot of watches. What did Crown and Caliber send us? Anything we didn't cover? Oh, here's a beautiful Spitfire. Yeah, Let's Spitfire real quick. And the the mark. We have a, yeah, we have two watches we didn't mention uh, before we wrap this IWC show up. Here's the uh, Pilot Spitfire. Is this what it's called? Um, an IWC Pilot Spitfire. This is a beautiful watch. It's a little smaller. It's like a forty. Yeah. Can you darken the camera a little bit, please, Cameron? Because it's getting a little blown out. It's it got... It's a sexy little watch, man. Yeah. And I got to be honest, for $3,650 used on Crown & Caliber, that seems like a lot of watch. Definitely is. I mean, under four grand for like a really fresh-looking uh, IWC with a chronograph, chronograph on it. looks date, dope. date. And a day and date, yeah. Plus, it's got the... The hands the are sword really hands. striking, too. Beautiful yep. watch. I would change the strap. I'm not about that gator, but that's just me. That's easy. 20 millimeter strap, Cameron. Yeah. How about that? And then yeah. what else did we miss? We missed something else? Which one is that? This beautiful. Uh, that is the mark. pilot's mark. Yeah. Right? What defines the pilot's mark? Uh, Isn't it just smaller? Well, you've got, yeah. The hands, time only, center second is yeah. going to be important. Um, what else? It's a pretty watch. That's it. Simple. Basic. Yeah, this one's a really gorgeous blue dial. And this one's $3,400. Yeah. And this one's a little, also a little... Can you put that next to the Spitfire? Is it the same size? It's smaller than the Spitfire? It's a little bit smaller. And definitely thinner because it's not chronograph. Right, yeah. These are good. I would I would give either of these to a, uh, a woman or a smaller man for sure. My girl would probably love that IWC. The, yeah. uh, that, that, you, um, you definitely pilot. go to the bigger watches. Because I, I, I would wear either wrist. of these. I have an eight inch wrist. I yeah. can't wear it. Yeah, you could. Yeah, I think my wrist is only like seven and a yeah. quarter or something. Speaking of which, uh, I want to end this show. I mean, that's the history of IWC. Yeah. There that's it is. That's a lot of information. That's It'll take lot. a while to digest. That's a lot of information. I, I think. You know, we haven't covered every watch they make, but we covered the the key moments yeah. in, in their history. And the cool, yeah, the cool little tidbits of uh, of history. Yeah, I want to end this one though on uh, a slight tangent. Uh, when we did our straps and spring bars and everything episode, 
uh, we put out put the tip out there that you should go on the internet and order a big box of spring bars and use a different set of spring bars every time. That was your tip. Yeah. I agree with your tip. I went out and bought a lifetime supply of spring bars for like $13. <laughs> I then posted on Instagram when I changed the strap on my IWC, pro tip, new spring bars every time. And a few people were like, no, don't do that. You need to get... Uh, for a very expensive watch, you need to get an OEM spring bar. You can't use these whatever ones that you buy on Amazon. So, rather than getting defensive, I went to the store. <laughs> and I spent $10 on six what were described as OEM IWC spring bars for that watch. So... Uh, the the spring bars that are holding the strap on right now are the cheapies I bought off of Amazon. I would like you to take off that strap, and I would like to have a brief discussion about the differences between whatever is claimed to be an IWC spring bar and the Amazon spring bar that I bought a lifetime supply of for <laughs> the cost of uh, six of them at a jewelry store. Um. What do you think, Cameron? Here we go. Let's go. Let's go to the magnifying glass. This is a 22 millimeter spring bar. Which okay. What's the one on the screen there? So this is the one that just came off your watch. Okay. These are the ones that you bought on Amazon. Those are the ones I bought on Amazon. That All came right. that came off my watch. And I'm gonna zoom way down in here. So don't try not to move that spring bar. So yeah. put the put the real one next to I it. Grab my tweezers, bro. That looks the same. Can you tell me the differences between these two items? So the differences, the one that is IWC or whatever mm -hmm. that comes from them is it, it has more tension on the spring, so a thicker, heavier duty spring. The actual spring, the is. actual spring. Okay, so it's firmer in the holes. Exactly, it's it's firmer okay. in the holes. Um, but again, depending on the quality of the spring bar you purchase as a replacement, right? Uh, I could I could tell you that. Almost all Swiss companies are getting their spring bars from the same place. Oh, okay. Uh, unless you have like a Rolex or there are some companies. That well, Rolex have, uses a unique sizing system, right? They have a unique sizing system. Yeah. And they also have unique ends on their spring bars. Okay. So uh, exclude Rolex. Yeah. So And there's a couple other companies that have some unique spr uh, spring bars. But for the most part, you're going to have the same. It's called a double flange spring bar. And that's that's the style of tip? Yeah, so you see, if you get in real close there... That's as close as I can okay. zoom in, brother. I'm well, sorry. Well, you've got two flanges so that you can actually get the spring bar tool in between those two flanges. Yeah, yeah. It's like a it. collar that you can yeah. kind of pry against. Yeah, there's two of them there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you've got... It should be a, a one to a one and a half... Uh, yeah, a one to a one and a half millimeter end that goes into the hole. Some companies will sell really cheap replacement spring bars. <laughs> yeah. And you want to stay away from the super cheap stuff because they can break if they're too cheap. I mean, um, I bought a I bought a but, box of like I mean, 500 for 10 bucks. Is that too cheap or is that a decent piece of thing that I just bought or 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 not? Because we're literally talking about something that is like a what you 500th can do is, the cost of the other oh, one. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And what you can do is basically try to rip it apart. Yeah. Can, when you get a set, <laughs> yeah. like just to a fail safe, when yeah. you get a set like that of cheap spring bars, take some pliers, grab and, each side. And try and pull it apart. The ends and try and just rip them out. Uh, if they rip out really easily, yeah. you've got a problem. I would buy a different set for It could be else. worth buying like a scrap case from somewhere and putting the spring bar in your scrap case and then like working it with a thing and trying to break it out of a case yeah. as well. Yeah. So, okay, I don't want to dwell on this forever. It's not a huge deal, but what is your conclusion on the, quote, OEM spring bar here versus whatever I bought? Uh, I, I think whatever you bought is good enough quality. You think so? Yeah. Yeah. Considering it's 500 times the cost. Yeah. Really, the... The only time I go OEM is when there's something unique about it, when yeah. they have a unique uh, spring bar. Okay. IWC, for all its advances, no unique spring bar. Yeah. Woo! That, my friends. And in fact, we even found out some of them don't some, have spring some, bars. No some, spring bars. That's in, a no. It's not even no a quick spring release bar. spring bar. That's a no spring yeah, bar system. It's a clip system that 
Kind of like think of uh, bicycle pedals. Oh yeah, click in the click in. Yeah, kind of like that. That's so bad. Yeah, great idea. I love I love this. Just these neat little innovative yeah. solutions. That was really cool. That guys is the history of IWC. Started uh, by an American. Started by an American. <laughs> if you want to buy uh, a, a, an American watch made in America by an American, designed by an American, engineered by some Americans. Weiss Watch Company. Yeah. <laughs> Weiss Watch Company on Instagram. Uh, the Smoking Tire on Instagram. Oh, no, I went away. Smoking Tire on Instagram. Uh, Crown and Caliber, if you want to buy any of the watches, every single watch we have shown on this program, except my personal IWC, which is in the not-sell department, <laughs> you will be able to buy a Crown and Caliber by the time this show airs. Um, and that minute repeater, I'm certain they will repair it. I don't know why it's broken. It came in like that. I'm sorry. Thank you, guys. Next week, it's all about dive watches, um, and that's going to be a cool show, too. I spent most of my early 20s scuba diving, so I have some background in this. Anything else, Cameron? No, I'm excited for that show because I, I dive as well. I'm excited because we're recording it in six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Get in. <laughs>